All right. Hi there, River Point. It's good to be here, man. That music right there. Now, that's good music. I had to steal guitar from Nashville. And so I just love that song. It was great stuff. Could you guys give them a hand? My gosh, it was good. So good. Well, my name is Blake, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Felt good to say that, and I just want to welcome everybody. I want to welcome all of our online listeners, everybody at Missouri City. I'm so glad that you're with us today. Thank you for joining us. I just want to say something really fast. If you're new here at River Point, we really want you to get involved. We want you to find your place. We don't want you to be lost in the cracks. And so um, it's important to us that you make friends and then like, also have like a sustainable pattern and way to have incredible spiritual growth with the people around here. And we think the best way for you to do that is to be involved in small groups. And so right in your seat back, there's a place right there for you to grab a card and to fill that out. We'd love to see you get involved and find some amazing community around here. Well, man, I just got back. I, I spent the weekend with a bunch of men at Men's Attack, and um, it was an amazing weekend. We saw guys really experience some amazing things. They, some guys had never shot a gun. They experienced that. There was some fishing, big fishing derby, I guess. And, um, man, it was, wasn't just that. There's some guys that are going to be coming back right now that are experiencing some real life change, and they're wanting to, like, be better dads, be better husbands, better fathers. And so they want to experience what it looks like to step back into their home. And right now is when the enemy will come along and sort of attack and give them self-doubt and insecurity. And, man, it's not going to change. And so I want you to pray for them as they come back and try to be better dads and husbands. Okay, will you commit to that? All right, awesome. Okay, so we're in a series right now, and this series is called A New Selfie. And today I want to speak specifically about the fear of change, okay? So I took my children on a sledding trip. And for me, it can never be like, hey, kids, let's just go down to the end of the street and we're going to experience that really fun little 10-foot hill. No. I lived in Colorado at the time. And I said, let's go up to Winter Park and let's sled down that 11,000-foot tall mountain. And so my wife was like, honey, I think this is a pretty bad idea. And I was like, no, it's going to be great. And so we all get in the car. They put on all their gear. We, we drive up the mountain, hour and a half away. And then when we get there, um, it's like a blizzard. The snow's like coming in sideways. And my daughters are like looking at this mountain that's like massive. And they have like this just sheer terror on their face. like, Daddy, I don't know if this is a good idea. I'm like, no, it's going to be great. Just, just get out. We're going to have a blast together. So... Uh, I have some pictures for you to show you what that would look like whenever we um, first got there. Here it is. Or maybe it's over here. Uh, yeah, there it is. So, so I'm not joking. This is treacherous conditions. It's really a bad idea, but I'm like, hey, let's do it. And so we get out of the car, um, and we climb up the mountain together. I have my four-year-old and my seven-year-old at the time. And so I sit down in the sled, and I put my seven-year-old in my lap. And then I decide to put my four-year-old on a sled by herself. <laughs> I'm not really sure why I did that, so I put my four-year-old in a sled by herself. And I'm just kind of thinking, this is going to be a nice, jolly little ride down the mountain. And so um, I'm like, okay, girls, are you ready? Let's go. And so I let my feet up, and it was like <laughs> a rocket was on my... I'm not joking. I was like, as soon as I let go, it's like, Poof, and we're like just going down super fast. I'm like, <laughs> like shaking, like this is a bad idea. I knew immediately. And so I'm like, I'm putting my feet down. I need to slow down. So I start putting my feet down. Well, when I did that, I had goggles on and the snow just came up. <laughs> It was covered. I couldn't see anything. I'm like going, <laughs> like, oh gosh, oh gosh. I start kind of making these sorts of sounds and I'm really scared. And so, my daughter Montana's sled starts to like turn to the side. And I, I thought, oh gosh, she's going to like tumble and hurt herself. And so being the great father that I am, I let go of the sled. <laughs> and her little body like turns around and she looks up at me. And she like locks eyes with me. And I will never forget that look the rest of my life. She's like, what have you done? <laughs> and... And I reach for and try to grab her, but again, I'm not joking. I think she was going 35 miles an hour. And so I look down the mountain, and 
I hadn't really thought this far, <laughs> like how I was going to stop at the bottom of the mountain. And um, there were like these massive railroad ties. And there was a sign on it that said, you're an idiot. No, it didn't. It said, uh, very dangerous, stop. <laughs> and so I looked down and there's these big metal signs and these big railroad ties. And it was one of those moments that, I, all joking aside, as a father, I was like, this is my fault. I did this. And it could be like serious. Like she could be paralyzed. She could break her neck. This could be, I, all these thoughts went like that, you know, just through my head like, what have I done? And I'm yelling as loud as I could. And you know what was awful is as a father, I knew I did this. It's my fault. And I, it's completely out of my control. And I, I can do nothing about it. Will you repeat after me? God's in control. And I'm not. For those of you that are control freaks, you just had some serious anxiety saying that. The biggest illusion that we have on earth is the illusion of control. If there's anything that I know about this life is that everything changes and I have very little control over it. I mean, do you know what I saw this weekend before we left on the men's attack? Your pastor Kelly came out with the flat bill hat on and he's looking all like 50 cent. I'm like, what? <laughs> What is going on? Like things are changing. <laughs> so I, I have um, three three reasons that I think we experience we we experience this fear whenever things change. Here's one of them. We don't get what we want. That's a reason why we have fear when it comes to change. We don't get what we want. Maybe maybe you're like, gosh, I really I really thought that I would be married, and I'm not understanding. Why, why I'm not married yet and you feel alone. Maybe it's, you, are you like prayed and prayed. I want to own a house. I, I really had a plan to own my ho own house by this time in my life. Or maybe for you it's like I've always wanted a promotion and it just isn't happening. And I've done everything I could. I've lived up to the expectations of my boss. But man, it's just created all this maybe fear and, and like self-doubt in you. So another reason why we have face fears because, number two, getting what we want and losing it. So then we go, oh gosh, well, this is another reason why we fear change because maybe, maybe you've been trying your hardest to be pregnant and, and you're like, why, why, why won't I have a baby? And then maybe you get the baby, right? So you, you don't get what you want by not having the baby. But then another thing is once you have the baby, now like I'm scared to death. Like what if something happens? What if this baby gets sick? What if I can't take care of it? What if I can't provide? What if I'm not a good parent? Like all these things. So then another thing is like you succeed. And so now what do we do if I'm going to lose all the success that I have? Like I, I've gotten where I want to be and I have all these people working for me. And they're counting on me. And it's like all this stress and anxiety now, right? So you're going to lose your success. Or maybe now you have the house. And now you're going, oh, great. How do, how do I pay the mortgage? How do I pay for all the insurance, right? So there's this fear of losing it. And the third thing is that... Getting what you don't want. So maybe it's cancer. You're like, I didn't plan on this. This, this, this isn't what I thought would happen in my life. So you, you have cancer. Maybe, maybe he or she left you, and now you're left alone raising kids, or and you just experienced this awful divorce. Or for you, maybe that you were fired. You're like, that's not what, it's not what I wanted. I didn't want, want to be fired. Or maybe it is that you have wanted to be married your whole life. And you're really alone. There's all these reasons why we have this change. And then it creates real fear. Like real fears. You can feel it like it's real. Maybe you can feel it in this room right now. Some fears aren't wrong. It's not that they're wrong or that they're sinful. Some are, some are perfectly normal. It's like a soldier that's in battle, right? Those fears are perfectly fine. Or, or for me right now, I have a 16-year-old daughter that just started driving. And it creates a lot of fear in my life. <laughs> And it maybe should, yours too. Um, but a, a lot of the fears that we have are, are just completely irrational. Like there's 90 fears that I have, and 86 of them are made up in my head. And they're just completely irrational. They make no sense, but I just continue to play out the worst possible thing that could happen, right? See, once we commit to make a change, it's funny how we immediately have to look fear in the face about how we're going to make this change, right? So Pastor Kelly, like, he decided to go on a diet, and now he's like, got to eat kale. He's not enjoying that. It's a fear. I understand that. And, so, and by the way, he is looking like a gorgeous chunk of love, isn't he? 
So anyways, I don't know where that came from. So there's real fears that we, that we have to face. And as I prepared for this talk, I kept thinking about this one idea that I kept kind of playing over and over in my head. And that's just pain and fear and how the relationship between the two are very real. Pain and fear. And so, for example, if I have a pain that's in my knee and I start going, gosh, man, it's killing me. It's giving me a, like a lot of pain. And then you go, well, man, I, I got to fix it. And so, therefore, I'm going to have to do physical therapy or I'm going to have to have surgery, right? So now this pain has created these fears of like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want physical therapy, right? And so once the pain surpasses the fear, then we do something about it and we make a change. This is true in a ton of areas in our lives. Maybe for you, you hate, you hate your career. You're not happy in your job. You've got a boss that's a jerk, and there's real pain, and there, there's fears, and those fears are real because like, wow, what, I, what if I leave and I have to find another job? And I mean, what, if, what if I don't make enough money? And so you feel stuck, and you feel like you're in bondage, and until, until the pain actually does surpass the fear, then you'll stay. And you maybe won't do anything. Maybe for you, it's being a parent. And like parenting, uh, you're parenting from this place of fear, trying to protect with good intentions. You, you don't mean to make sure that your kids don't experience pain because, because you're so wrapped up and like, I don't want my kids to have this kind of pain. Then you end up sort of overcompensating, overprotecting, and sort of obsessing over every possible thing that could happen to your kids. I know I've done that in the past. Like you just kind of parent out of fear. Or maybe for you it's a relationship and it's toxic and it's bringing tons of pain and, and the fear of leaving keeps you there. Like every day there's pain and staying, but the fears of starting over and being alone keeps you right where you are, and so you're stuck and you're afraid. Pain and fear. So that's sort of where I've been wrestling and grappling. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. I'll tell you, I love, I love to watch people that are really amazing at doing trapeze artists. I know that's weird, but I, I love to watch them like climb up this massive ladder. And the whole time you're like, wow, that's so high. You're so stupid. Like you're going to swing around on a rope. And it's like just like this crazy thing that they do. And so uh, this book was talking about these trapeze artists. And they said they flip and spin through the air with grace. And then, then they trust that their flight will end with their hands sliding into the secure group, grip of a partner. They also know that only the release of the secure bar allows them to move on with grace to the next. And before they can be caught, they must let go. They must brave the emptiness of space in order to fly. See, there's freedom and beauty in, in letting go. But man, even when we know that, our fear can be so crippling that we find ourselves bound up in chains, like gripping for dear life what we have because the fear of letting go is too, too strong. And so why do we, why do we hold on at all costs to things that are causing us so much pain? Maybe today you're staring that option in the face and maybe you're going, I, I need to change. Knowing that you're supposed to make the move, but fear has got you and you're afraid to choose. Learning to find freedom in letting go is one of the most important things that we can learn in this life. See, change happens when the pain of holding on becomes greater than the fear of letting go. Will you guys say that statement with me? Here we go. Let's say it together. Change happens when the pain of holding on becomes greater than the fear of letting go. In James chapter 1, there's this passage that says in the NIV, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And the first time I heard that passage, I like wanted to punch James in the face. Like, consider it joy when I face trials. Here's the way it says uh, in the NIV or something. Another passage. <laughs> so here's what it says. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. See, troubles will come. It's not, it's not if, 
in the passage. It doesn't ever say if. It says when they come. And so what are we going to do about that when they come? Is it an opportunity for us? Or are we going to allow those challenges and troubles to cripple us? So I know fears are real and phobias are real. I kind of did a small study on some phobias. And so I'm just making a little bit of light of some of the phobias that we face. So maybe you have this. It's actually called chorophobia. It's actually a diagnosis. And it's a fear of clowns. Maybe that is like a little bit spooky to you. And I understand it's, it's spooky to me. And so another fear that we have is a fear of gold. And it's called aurorophobia. Aurorophobia. As your pastor... If you have this struggle, I'll help you <laughs> with that struggle. I'll take care of them for you, the gar. We can just put this away for you. So another fear that we have is the fear of heights, and it's called acrophobia. And so maybe this is a fear that you have. It's sitting way high on top of a... That scares me a little bit. So uh, we also have this fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. There's an actual diagnosis. It's called arabidnophobia. <laughs> and so if you have that, I've, I'm sorry that you have that fear. And so there's one more I want to tell you about. This is actually something your pastor Kelly struggles with. He, I actually told him this diagnosis today. He didn't know this. It's a fear of mice. And it's called <laughs> musophobia. I said, Pastor Kelly, you have musophobia. He said, oh, you're right, I do. I have mus- He's scared to death, like a little girl. He screams. <laughs> little mice comes along. This man, he's a big, strong man, but dude will scream like a girl. Little mice is around. Those guys just scare him to death. I love it. And so we have real fears. We have these phobias that, that are real. And I don't mean to make light of it if any of those are struggling with There's actually another one. It's a fear. It's a fear of laughter. And so if you have that one, let's all just laugh and make you mad. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't laugh. And so uh, there's a statement that I want to say to you, and um, that, that's a statement that I want to hear you say really loud and strong at every campus. Let me hear you. If there's no pain, there's... No pain. Say it again. If there's no pain... Okay, so I don't know if you know a lot about resistance training, but um, this here is my man, Terry. Hi, Terry. You have very nice muscles, Terry. You have very nice muscles. <laughs> All right, stand back here, Terry. So I don't know if you know what resistance training is, but resistance training is like when you do a whole bunch of reps, and then like you've done like the third set, maybe you're done with eight to ten reps, and then you do what's called resistance training. So it's a way that you actually take your muscles and completely fatigue them to the max. So you like, that's when you say like, you know how people say, man, he's so ripped. So this is actually what does it. So this is actually a lot of weight. And so I brought Terry out here to show you and demonstrate what it looks like to have resistance training, okay? So the point is, like, while you're doing resistance training. <laughs> you got to be serious. <laughs> I'm going to hurt myself. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. The point is, like, while you're underneath the weight, oh, gosh, you um, are supposed to let it down really slow. And the point of that is because you want to make sure that you're not, <laughs> that you're not, uh, you got it. yeah, I got it, I got it. So the point is, you want to have somebody that cares enough about you to say, listen, man, let it down slower, let it down slower. So let me hear you, Terry. Let it down slower. Slower, slower, slower. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Because if you just give up while you're underneath the weight, you gotta bring it up. You gotta bring it up. You can't. Woo! I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Give Terry. Here. Good job, man. Woo! Glory to God. I'm still alive. So, there's the thing that I want you to know, and that is that when you're doing resistance training. You have to commit completely. You can never get to a place where you're like, I'm just going to give up. Otherwise, Terry, like, hey, hey, this isn't funny. You're going to get hurt. And so resistance trains when you're like completely fatigued. You're about to max out, and you really have to have a spotter. And so my question for you is, is there anybody in your life that loves you enough that while you're underneath the pain, while you're experiencing some hardships and some trials and some troubles, do you have anybody in your life that says, embrace the pain, and let it down slow because the pain's good for you. Embrace it because you're growing right now more than you ever would have thought or imagined. I'm completely out of breath. (laughs) Pain is your biggest asset. See, 
Your persistence in the middle of your resistance will define your commitment. Somebody say, preach, Pastor Blake. Your persistence in the middle of your resistance will define your commitment. So pain, it's, it is your biggest asset. It's important that you understand that true growth always happens during the pain. There's two ways that you can look at pain. Either you can become bitter, the world's against me, you're a victim. Or two, I'm going to grow from this and I'm going to choose to be victorious. See, we find people over and over in the Bible who faced massive changes and they have to overcome their fears in the middle of those changes. In 2 Timothy, there's this passage that talks about how um, young Paul is um, actually saying to his young friend Timothy, um, you just can't imagine, let me explain this just a little bit, you can't imagine how close the two of them are. Like, he, he loves this young guy. Um, he had watched him develop and grow his whole life. Paul was Timothy's main trainer. Think of him like Mr. Miyagi to Mr. Danielson, okay? He's like the guy that's kind of taught him everything that he knows. And so Timothy knew Paul was in this jail cell and that he was not escaping this time. He knew that there was no chance of escape and he was absolutely going to die. And he didn't know what he was going to do, how he could handle the weight. He didn't know how he was going to carry on without him. There was so much work to be done, so many churches that needed assistance. He, he didn't know how he was going to provide all the spiritual guidance. And he was overwhelmed. And the torch being left to Timothy, this young predecessor, was more weight than he felt like he was able to press. He was overwhelmed and he was timid. And if you only knew all the life stories that the two of them had experienced together, they had been through thick and thin. You can just imagine how much Timothy looked up to Paul. So I need you to imagine with me what it must have meant to Timothy when he gets this final letter. It's the last book that Paul ever wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as he opens it up to read it, I need you to imagine with me Timothy's feelings when he's reading it. But also thinking of it as he's like thinking about where Paul's at and the experience of what Paul is doing while he's writing this. Paul would have been in this cave-like jail cell that was like surrounded by rats and feces it's a place where there would have been awful, awful smell. It would have been uh, ho horrible in knowing that Paul was already pretty crippled. He had been beaten. He had been lashed. He had been stoned. He'd had two shipwrecks, and he was almost blind. So Paul was there to be murdered. He's in awful pain. The conditions are horrible, and he knows he's going to die. He knew that this was the time. And that this moment matters. And so you can imagine the urgency along with the finality of him writing this to his young Timothy. He starts out with this, my dear son, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I don't know if you can see him, but he's over in the corner of this prison cell. He's writing in gigantic letters because he's half blind. He can't see worth a stinking flip. He's crying, he's moaning, he's praying, he's longing for a visitor. He's utterly alone. He's thinking about his good friend and companion because Paul loves Timothy. He writes this letter to encourage him, to prepare him, to speak of endurance, to speak of suffering, of perseverance, and the hope that we will meet again in glory. He's saying goodbye. So how, how can Paul, it trips me out. You want to talk about the end of his life, it's over. And how, how can he write of these sorts of things under these kinds of conditions? And so here's, here's what he says in 2 Timothy 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Will you say this? Say, endure suffering well. Say that. Well. Paul's leaving Timothy with, with his final words, and in his dying breath, he's breathing the last bit of life that he has, saying, fight, young soldier. I want you to endure till the end. I want you to please your commanding officer. I am chained up, but God's word is not. Keep working, keep running, finish well. Timothy, he, he could have very easily responded with, man, I, I can't do it. Why, why me? 
Why now? I don't have what it takes. I can't afford it. I don't have the time. Can I say something to you? The fears that we don't face will be our limitations. Let me say that again. The fears that we don't face will become our limitations. There's a guy that came up to me this weekend while we were at Men's Attack, and he um, was really honest with me. He um, has been a part of RPC for about six months. And he said, Pastor Blake, you just don't know how much God has changed me because of you and because of this church. I'm a different man. He said, six months ago, I had anxiety attacks, like three of them a day. He said, I, I struggled with my wife more than you'll ever know. I, I was on the edge and the verge of divorce. We've talked about it for about three years now, and he was done. He said he's never really been very present with his kids. He's never really engaged them. He's never really loved them. And he said, but now, every single day, we talk about God in my home. We read the Bible every single day. They are starting to understand who Jesus is. They talk about Jesus. They talk about Jesus being in their heart. They have hope. They have love. And my home is filled with joy. I, I have never loved my wife like this. I've never loved my kids like this. And my wife thought, this is going to change. This isn't going to last. You don't, you're not really going to change. I thought this would be like three days, maybe a week. But it's been six months and this week, his wife said to her, I don't even know who you are anymore. You're a different man. He said, Pastor Blake, we're falling in love again. Like, we're really changed. And I'm losing weight. And I feel like a whole new man. He actually changed. And it's only because of the power of Jesus Christ being alive in his life. Yeah. <laughs> Man, making a big life change, it's scary. And there is definitely fears that come along with that. But you know what's even more scary? Knowing that you've heard the voice of God to do something, but you do nothing. See, when you choose to face your fear, and you look it square in the eye, when you choose to face your fear, I forgot what it is, so I really need this slide. <laughs> when you choose, no, that's not it. He screwed up. <laughs> so when you choose to face your fear, you will find your freedom. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad I came back over here and saw that. When you choose to face your fear, you really will find your freedom. Somehow, I, I don't really know how, but somehow trapeze artists get that. How, how do they let go? How? With such ease and such grace, they just fly through the air. I, I heard this interview of a trapeze artist, and uh, he said this. He said, everyone applauds for me because when I leap into the air and do these flips and twists, they, they go bonkers, and they think I'm a hero. But the real hero is the catcher. He's the one carefully watching me, and his timing has to be perfect. The only thing I have to do is stretch out my hands and trust Trust that he will be there to catch me and pull me back up. I think it was Trappy's artist that coined the phrase, let go and let God. I think for us today, we need to recognize that we aren't in control. But we serve a great God who's watching you. He's paying attention. He, he knows where you're at. His timing is perfect. and He's going to catch you. and He's going to pull you up. And so there I was, my daughter's going 35 miles an hour, I'm yelling at my wife like it's her fault, <laughs> and I'm going, Montana, Allie, and I see her little body going down this mountain backwards, scared out of my mind, mortified, and she slides up and hits right in between two of those big beams. And her little sled pops straight up. And her little body does a full flip in the air. She's like, I'm not kidding. She had to be four or six feet in the air. Like just, and I'm just watching this. And then she lands on her little belly. And she slides like this. And her body's just sitting still. 
And I'm just like, oh, gosh. And then she pops up, and she goes, that was fun. Let's do it again, Daddy. <laughs> and I was like, no. We're going home. This is a stupid idea. I, I was done. <laughs> God, God completely had her. He did. And I wish that I could say that I trusted him with all my heart, but I didn't. I, I was too lost in my own irrational thoughts of what I thought would happen. I chose fear instead of faith. And those two things, fear and faith, they cannot coexist. They're the opposite of one another. Either you are walking in fear or you are walking in faith. There's nothing that can help heal you of your fear other than faith. So say this with me. I'm taking a word. Did you see that? I'm bringing it. I don't trust nobody. <clears throat> You'll say this with me. We need to spend our time asking God to give us more faith instead of asking him to protect us from pain. Let's pray. Father... We just come to you right now and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us for the times that we forget that you're there to catch us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us more faith. I know that in this place and the Missouri City campus, there is a lot of pain. There's a lot of challenges and struggles because we're guaranteed that in this life. But I pray, Father, that we would sit under the pain and we would endure suffering well that we would thank you and consider it joy that you are growing our faith. As weird as that is, Lord, I just pray that we would be the kind of people that are gracious for a God who would love us enough to actually work on us, to help our character grow, to help us to become the men and women of God that you've called us to be. I pray, Father, that we would bring healing to our communities around us, that our coworkers would understand who you are because they watch how we live in faith when the worst things happen. I pray, Father, that our, we would be effective in the schools that we go to. I pray, God, that this city would be different because of the way that we love you, God. I pray that we would pursue you with all of our heart and that, God, we would demonstrate faith in a way that the world would take notice. So God, we, we just want you to know tonight that we love you with all of our hearts. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.